I t clap, take two. <laughs> yes, take take two. <laughs> yeah. Nice to see you, Aikman. Now, now you're not, not in your basement and the snow isn't building up on your yes. satellite. The, you had your daughters and we can speak with a better. Yes, and the, and the cat isn't importuning me to let him out because uh, it's too cold to go and is to go out. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> anyway, so, so it was such a lovely conversation that we had. And unfortunately, towards the end, it um, a lot of what we were saying was probably yes. off by the recording. I'll, I'll still share the recording on, on that video cast series. And um, I don't really want to go over the same ground again, but, but I... Uh, I still feel that it would be nice to briefly introduce who you are in case pe people just um, okay. see th this bit. So um, if you don't mind sharing your, your um, connection with particularly the North American bioregional movement and your long journey into exploring um, bioregional development also in, in the region where you live, um, just just give give us a little introduction of, of um okay okay um um well gosh i mean the story starts you know when i was 10 year old 10 years old which we went into last time but to to um uh which you know and um my experiences that i had that ex experience that i had as a child um put me on my path of uh being you know i, I feel in many ways kind of guided by by Gaia in some way, but um, cutting forward to how I, you know, I was led to the Ozarks, to the Ozarks bioregion, and we arrived almost about 50 years ago uh, in the Ozarks in uh, March of, of, of 1971. And um, my intent was to, you know, live in a place that made sense to me. Uh, uh, there was just so much madness in the city and so much and i already saw that the, the disecology of the way that uh, uh, human beings live particularly in the urban areas was so enormous that i i couldn't i couldn't deal with it and uh and so uh, uh, several of us moved down here to be part of what would you call i guess the back to the land movement mm -hmm. but um having come to the ozarks and getting a sense of it for 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 some years um I um, began to get a sense of the Ozarks as a, as a region mm -hmm. and realized that um, whereas I had, we had many um, acquaintances and friends and um, um, other people involved in the in back to the land movement across the border into, into Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Northwest Arkansas is, is, a, is, is a, a part of the Ozarks. So a bioregional identity for the place that I lived began to form that was transcendent of the of the geopolitical boundary but, and so but it's interesting also that in this journey because in i feel like in many ways there's there are parallels now between that time and the time that we have now where bioregionalism is also being increasingly of interest to people but you also get a lot of people who just want to create their little community and live a little bit closer to the land and do the appropriate technology and, yes. and there's this whole wave that has come before that you were in and last time we talked about john todd and the new alchemy yes Institute, yes and and we talked about robert gilman and yes the villages. yes um, so so it's kind of interesting how would you with that long experience and hindsight reflect on this point in time for, for people as they're coming back to the land and re-inhabiting you're saying the present point in time yeah uh-huh um well I, I just think it's um there's a perennial there's a perennial, um, you know, um, wavelength here, and and there have actually been a number of back to the land movements. Yeah. Uh, I had a book from 1917, which was which 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 was a back to the land movement book, yeah. about about moving back to the land. And then before us, as I mentioned before, um, pe people pop, uh, who were uh, seminal um, aspects of what I call the third wave, going back to Henry George. And then in the United States, after that, well, you know, um, the um, the uh, the um, uh, Ralph Borsodi and uh, Robert Swan and the uh, all these people that constitute the third wave, uh, you know, between capitalism and, and the political economics of capitalism and socialism. There's a tremendous 
backstory here of, of immense depth and, and immense um, import. And then to put the ecological dimension on it, around it, completes the equation of the third way. And so, um, and, and encoded in all that is uh, an impulse by people to move to, to places that have deep ecological reality and de ecological integrity. There, there's no, there's a, the word integrity has limitless power. It means truth. It means, um, you know, honesty, et cetera, et cetera. But also the, the prime dimension of, of life on earth can be explained in terms of ecological integrity and how much of it we have left and how much is here. And in order to live immersed in and close to the reality of ecological integrity, is 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 a, a kind of a metaphysic of 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 the of a driver for the for the different waves of back to the land. There's an impul impulse to be where there's sanity of a deepest sort. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's thinking, as you, as you were saying that, I was just thinking that a a properly understood what what Darwin was really trying to say with his theory of evolution, um, rather than survival of the most fitted in the competition for scarce resources, was survival of the most fitting in the co-creation of collaborative abundance. And, and that fitting is again talking about integrity. How do you as a part fit into and are integral to the yes. larger whole that sustains you and brings you forth? Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's just, you know, to the term integral, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is, um, you know, the, the people follow the works of Ken Wilber, you know, yeah. and, and, and that, but they're, the, this the integral the ecological integral or the integ ecological integrity is just limitlessly deep mm -hmm. and it's limitlessly has limitless um, depth of meaning and multiplicity of meaning there's no end to it and and, and it's all about ecological integrity and I mean, um i mean that, that, that's also in, i mean veering off into something mm -hmm. another dimension of this is these two forms of spirituality that you can have, like, because you mentioned Wilbur and you, you, you get a lot of people, like the, the whole integral, I, I learned a lot from Wilbur and the integral and spiral dynamic frameworks and so on, but there's a tendency of being very categorizing. So it's almost like putting into boxes, creating structure systems, drawers, and, yeah. put everybody in there. Yeah. And, and, and it can, I'm not saying Wilbur says this, but it can be, akin to the, the spiritual seekers that look for transcendence rather than imminence, like find enlightenment mm. in the beyond consciousness yeah. out of this body. And, and there's a different type of spirituality that is about imminence, that is about um, the, the, the intimate and the ultimate coming together um, in, the, in the sense of really embodying the, the living earth again. And, yeah. Most definitely, most definitely, and not to, I have not, not a critique of Wilbur or, or, or such thought systems, and sometimes I think about the, the tremendous, uh, you know, a rarefied intellect, intellect, intellectuality of someone like Sri Aurobindo, mm -hmm. um, but, it, um, but, 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 but the difference here to me is the, is the non-anthropocentric mm -hmm. dimension, the ecocentric dimension. And that, that is, you know, the expression of ecological integrity within the realm of the human mind and the human spirit and the spirituality that comes, comes about from an, an ecocentric uh, apprehension of um, being more or less, you know, in the analogy of, I mentioned it last time, direct pointing in Zen, um, these are, or, or, or in the Tao, uh, um, these, all these things are derivative but going directly to the to the one to one with uh, an apperception of the experience of the of 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 the of the uh, of, of the earth's reality um, without any inter human intermediary that is to me the most pro profound spiritual um, connection that is possible mm -hmm. and the deepest and the most limitless and the most even cosmological as i mentioned last time it, it takes us out. It, you know, I, I like to say that the the Earth is what interprets the, the the nature of the universe to us. 
that's how we can we can perceive and the that's nature right. of the universe and how it works because this was meant to be as thomas says this this manifestation on of gaia was meant to be it's not an aberration it's part of the code and so but, so how was your connection into the work of thomas berry and and have you had the opportunity to be with him and work with him? oh oh yes yes we worked directly um um really starting in 1982 um, I wrote him a letter in which I, I mentioned that um, to him that I had read some of his unpublished works that were given to me by a, a close friend who was who was a student and a, and a friend of and a co-worker with Thomas. And um, having read those publications and being absolutely astounded by them, I wrote to Thomas and I said, I you know I I think there's something that I would like to to bring to you because in your writings I see everything but this this one word this one concept and i said and i said bioregionalism so you planted the seed with him and then it uh, it's very it's very possible and i and i sent him a crystal mm -hmm. in the letter i taped it in there and i said i I've, i feel like your work is a is a completely saturated solution and i would like to in from my perspective um uh, present you know send this seed this crystal to you as in this 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 vajra uh, of the word bioregional to see what you think how it how it how it what it precipitates out in you and um when i told my friend carolyn that i was going to write to thomas she said well he probably won't write back to you and this and that but he wrote me back immediately and uh, and then very shortly thereafter he came out with this piece of, about bioregions and it was the most astounding writing and in that writing in the first paragraph he connects about the bioregions of earth and and their nature as he describes it as being self-healing rep self-replicating self te uh self-teaching uh, all this um he, he lays that out in the first paragraph as a direct you know connection to his universe story you know it's the most most amazing thing in one paragraph he takes he takes us to you know from his incredible um exegesis of 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 Chardin, of Chardin you know where, where 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 Thomas did an incredible what I call course correction on Chardin mm -hmm. um uh, and um brings it um the universe right here in and express it in, in as it's expressed where we live everyone lives in a bioregion it is an astounding thing yeah, I was I was trying as you were saying I was trying to see if I can find that piece by him um, because it is really really powerful. You, um, yes. Hold on a sec. Uh, it probably will take me. To, oh no! Wait a minute. There we are. I'm not going to claim that I that I that I brought Biregional to Thomas Thomas, but there's a possibility that I did. And uh, <laughs> I mean, it's all in, in the very spirit of what you were saying at the beginning that this is all coming through. Um, and, yes. and the very point of what we're talking about is that you and I are expressions of the land that we walk on, that we identify with, that we belong to, that has brought us forth. And these yes. days, just it might not, it's not for you. you. You're 50 years in the Ozarks, but it's not where you were born. I'm 10 years here on Mallorca. It's not where I'm born. People in these days f might find attraction to a bioregion that they choose to start the process of re-inhabitation in that isn't their whole home bioregion but the, the the whole point is this is coming through us it's not about individual <laughs> property rights or I, yeah, yeah exactly it's not uh, yeah i make no claim you know about about the origin of anything that i've done or or you know any copyright or or, or any provenance that, that comes out of my ego like nothing i've said this many times it's a bit of a tape loop but none of the things that i've ever done that, that had any resonance or depth or import had, had anything to do with my my ego mm -hmm. it was it just came through in some way which i can't explain it just moved through me i was a vehicle i was a vehicle mm -hmm. but nothing nothing <laughs> nothing of of my self-identification has anything to do with anything i've ever done that had any value whatsoever <laughs> so the so when you were what was it called new haven farm the the, the project that you were the the alternative new life new life, new life farm. farm yeah yeah and 
and then, so this was, you, you connected to Thomas and he started writing on bioregionalism, but the, the, then you had a regional gathering in the Ozarks and a couple of years later, the first mm. American gathering. Yeah, I mean, yes, we talked about yeah. this in the last recording. I'm just sort of yeah. trying to, to remember, remind other people to also go back to the last yeah. recording. Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I, had a revel I had a revelatory experience and I, mm -hmm. I can tell you that I've, I felt it come into me well, I was before I heard the word bioregionalism. It just it just said this something said to me. Well, not as though it were speaking in it was speaking in words, but it, it my brain translated this. Said you know it's foolish about these 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 um, these state lines. Here, you know there's an integrity here, and I and I and I had the impulse to bring together the back back to the land groups uh, that we knew in, in in the mid 70s, which there were many. That were in the Ozarks, not not just in Missouri and Arkansas, but the Ozarks, and we had so much in common because of the place we lived. That's one of the definitions of bioregionalism: the place you live tremendously affects, you know, your whole being, your whole life, everything you have to do. So the impulse came into me before I ever heard the word, but it, but from that point forward, I began to see how bioregionalism, or the, the idea of the bioregion, integrates everything that I'd ever thought about everything that ever made any sense to me in, in my in my whole uh, study uh, uh, and immersion in an ecological mind which goes back as far as i can remember but started coming to me in the late 60s um so ecological mind and then the, the most profound expression of it is is the idea of bioregions and bioregionalism and from that point in the mid 70s when this idea came to me Later, I heard the word bioregionalism, which was electrifying in Peter Berg's work in Planet Drum Foundation. But it took about, then I started thinking about bringing together all the ecological work that was going on in the Ozarks across the, the, the whole spectrum of the 28 dimensions that I, that I had in that writing that I sent you. Let's bring all of this together. All the bioregionalists, the permaculturists, let's bring us together. Let us sit down together and formulate basically an ecological design of for uh, an ecological nation. And it took me about three years to bring this together. And the first one was in October of 1980. And then at the, at, and there I presented the idea of a Congress of Congresses or a Continental Bioregional Congress. And in the, in the second Oak, 1981, we had a consensus, which a, a meeting amongst people who were there, including Peter Berg and people from Planet Drum who came to the second Ozark Area Community Congress. And there we actually made a resolution to the Congress, which was passed by the plenary of the Congress. We worked in a Congress format, working committees, and then we made consensus on essentially what I call a green constitution for the Ozarks nation. And, and one of the resolutions that were passed in the second one was to have a um, North American Bioregional Congress. And from that point in October of 1981, I started organizing the first North American Bioregional Congress. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, of course, we talked about that last time. It was all yeah. letter writing and... and yes, all, all letters and... Yeah. <laughs> it was amazing. No, it was I, 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 I did look through the documents that you sent and I was wondering whether, uh, like this, this, the Total Ecology Program platform... Um, yeah. It, is that somewhere online? Because it would be really nice to be able to link to it so people could actually see this document that, that you started writing in 1986 and the last draft was in 2010 or something. Yeah. So it's, it's yes. Long. Yeah, I, I tend to make uh, uh, decades long drafts, iterations of my primary pieces. Mm -hmm. I have one, another one called the Regener Regenerative Investment Fund. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that later. We're and uh, and I and that's got ten. That's got ten mm. iterations. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and the the bioregionalism and ecological economics, which started out as a as a title in conventional economics as a Guyan disease, mm -hmm. the diagnosis and cure yeah. through ecological economics has has multiple iterations over fifteen or twenty years. I I don't usually do that, but anyway, yeah. But do you, do you have any of them linkable on, on the web or is there any way to share it? I, you know, I, um, I don't, I don't even know where to post them. But may, maybe we'll, we'll talk about it. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll put them as a guest post on my Medium blog and then-, then I would love that. Yeah. I would love that. I've never, I've been a little lack, lacking in imagination yeah. of using the web. 
I would love that, Daniel. I would be very grateful <laughs> if yeah, I could post those on your on your yeah, site. gladly because they're they're really historical documents, and 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 not just historical documents. That's what I find sometimes so humbling that, and it's happened to me over and over when I revisit Bucky Fuller, when I revisit even Patrick Geddes 110 years ago. Uh, um, how there are certain impulses that just, I mean, that it also makes us understand how culture and civilization and evolution changes. We, we look at it from our own limited human time scale lifespan perspective, and everything seems like it should happen tomorrow. But, but really, these transformations have been going on. We're in the middle of them. We have been in the middle of them for, for centuries. And, and they're just, we're spiraling around the same from primordial power eh? and and um mm. so it's yeah. just wonderful to, to 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 learn from the previous journeys around <laughs> well yeah. i would i would say that they are the uh, primordial and historic eco holofractals mm. there there are these the these these patterns that exist in, in gaia in the universe and the natural world that are, are in that are virtually timeless and 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 every aspect of them is everything else mm -hmm. it's in it's you know it's the hologrammatic universe in, a st in the most stark way mm -hmm. you know the, the quantum entanglement uh, is uh, uh someone said that that uh, I, I it's a very superficial knowledge that i have uh, uh, of this but it, it suggests that it, the quantum entanglement in quantum mechanics prefigures or suggests the holographic universe mm -hmm. and i suggest that that holographic universe and and the unified field, as I mentioned in an email, is right here, and we're in it. We live it. We're living in it, in this immense, almost really timeless set of 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 realities, all of which are co-creative of everything else, regardless of time. Yeah, it's pretty mind-boggling when when, when <laughs> we get close to you interpreting what what we're actually part of. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, there's so many directions mm. that I would like to go and or come back to uh, to go somewhere else. Um, I mean, the the first North American Bioregional Congress was held in in which place? It was held in uh, in the um, in the the um, the Tall Grass Prairie, but it was in Missouri, mm -hmm. um, not far from Kansas City. Okay, and. Um, as I, as I mentioned before, just the, the genesis of it was an absolutely magical experience mm -hmm. in, in another reality. As I said, it was completely, com completely done two weeks before we, ha it, it, we had it. Everything was done, and I didn't know what to do with myself for two weeks before we had it. Mm -hmm. And I've never experienced anything like that. It's a good example of not, not being there. And, and, I, and I thought, you know, I'm, I was asked by someone, well, how do you do this? You know, with letters and all this, and I said, I have no idea. I I felt like my 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 mind was working at about fifteen levels at once simultaneously, without me really being a part of it. It, it. it was, but but anyway, this this first Congress was was entirely over five days, entirely uh, an experience out of out of out of any known. It was a com entirely experience of non ordinary reality the entire time. In what it was like it was like it was like like veils being lifted all constantly and looking through them into another another way of being um which to me is the the um the un unpacking or the unfolding or the apotheosis or something of of the ecocentric mind or the eco ecocentric experience it was, it was like nothing i've ever ex and all the other congresses to some degree or another particularly the second and the third were like this and and I, my words i have no words to show, to express this it, it was it was just like walking into one realm after another that was seemed like normal although i've never experienced anything like it and that, that's why still the the, the bioregional congress communities even after all these years we're still feeling the resonance of this to some degree it's much attenuated and dissipated over time but it's it's like it's alive to me still 
but but in, in terms of imagining the the actual setting and yeah um, did you have a lot of sort of plenary where everybody was listening yeah. to somebody or was there a lot of individual yeah. groups because you said you yeah. worked in working groups and yes like yes group. yeah basically we um we took the oak template which was the congress the very important word congress you know and it it it's it, it, it implies it, it it demands actually a um egalitarian a horizontal relationship mm -hmm. has almost nothing to do with a conference as we know conferences it was not people say oh the, the north american biogenal conference no 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 not a conference it's a, a gathering of peers in the ecocentric context and in a bioregional context to um bring together and synthesize uh basically we did we worked on um and one thing that we had is a tremendous consensus process mm -hmm. we had what i think what i believe is the world's greatest ever a consensus facilitator her name is carolyn estes and she's absolutely legendary she 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 got she did consensus gatherings of five thousand people at once during the berkeley uh, uprising in the 60s um her skill at at uh doing a consensus meeting is otherworldly mm -hmm. um and she she could bring consensus about through the most unbelievable circumstances so we had that going for us our process was so clean there were no back rooms in it there were no cabals back there were no nobody's agenda was able somebody who had an agenda to say i want this congress to be this way including myself mm -hmm. could had anywhere to stand mm -hmm. it was it was a it was a luminous crystal clear completely horizontal absolutely 100 percent participatory and phenomenally gender balanced process i was going to ask you those two questions next um to, because of course i always feel like we, we need to understand events and even writing like sometimes i've seen people get really empty about ian mchark writing about man doing this and man doing that of course today we would never kind of take man as the general noun for humanity women measure and of all things but <laughs> not more, more of the measure of all things but but um mm -hmm. but but you have to take it in the time and it, like okay so you had gender balance but to what extent did you engage with the original teachings of the land and indigenous wisdom and and did you also have a lot of racial diversity or was it quite a white gathering we had we had a um we had a, a very strong not lot not numer numerically strong but extremely strong contingent of native people mm -hmm. um coming from uh, navajo nation um from um the great lakes from uh odawa mm -hmm. and um from dene mm -hmm. or from uh, f navajo navajo uh uh and hopi hopi navajo dene I mean, it's the same Navajo Dene, and um, from the Great Lakes, and uh, we had um, some very, very powerful uh, uh, people from those uh, tribes with us, which was incredible, and they were participated in our in our sessions. Um, our first resolution that we made to the Congress was was to honor all of Native American treaty rights, going back to the first and we had a we had a process of consensus on that it was very intense very powerful um and not easy not easy um and and some people were having trouble with that uh but 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 it passed and the the, the grandmothers were getting were feeling very antsy feeling very kind of like um drained out during the process because it was it was difficult for them to have us you know going through these long this long deliberation but we did come to consensus on it. It was very profound. It's the first resolution. The NABC one North American Bioregional Congress one proceedings are are printed out. There, there's there's not that many of them around, but they're they're a, they're a rare document. And that is that when we passed many resolutions of the Congress coming from our committee. So we had working committees on um, health and um, forestry and permaculture and ecological agriculture and um land tenure I'm, i may be mis misnaming some of these i may be conflating some of them with the oak 
the Ozark Area Community Congress working committees. Mm -hmm. but the committees would work together, uh, pers uh, construct a resolution, and then bring it to the plenary. Mm -hmm. And then the plenary, as a, as a Congress, as a rep representative body, would then deliberate on the work of the committees and then consents or not upon those. And then, um, so, um, yeah, and it, uh, that was how we did it. And, uh, and every morning, uh, we would have a, a, a meeting, and, and Carolyn Estes, would, would, the, the facilitator, would call a meeting at 7 o'clock in the morning sharp. And you had to be there, right on the dot. And then that group of people would propose a preliminary agenda for the day. So nothing was made up ahead of time. It was a completely fluid, organic process. And so the agenda committee of the morning comprised of whoever would get up and make that date at that time. Carolyn would facilitate that meeting. We would come up with a, an agenda, take that meeting to the morning plenary, and then we would deliberate upon that agenda until we got consensus on it. And, and, and without Carolyn, I don't know if we ever could have done this. We did this every day. Well, how many people in, were at the 200. 200, wow. And yeah. people were sleeping in tents or in, in uh, we had we had cabins and tents mm -hmm. and um and, there, and, and, set, and camps were set up affinity groups there was an aboriginal camp set up with a fellow named john stokes uh who uh brought his didgeridoo there and the first time in my life i ever heard of didgeridoo and i don't know if you've ever heard of paul winter i don't know yeah he's a he at that time and still is among some circles a famous um um alto sax player uh, uh, play a lot of nature music mm -hmm. anyway uh, i'll never forget there are scenes of scenarios from the first congress of of and, uh, and yeah some of these names that that so intimately are connected with the north american or particularly the californian um kind of or, or west coast by regional movement um, so you've already mentioned Peter Burke and Raymond Dasman, yeah. but Gary Snyder did, was yeah. Gary, Gary Snyder was invited, mm -hmm. and he was he, he sent a registration to me, and I was I was thrilled beyond all measure because I he's one of the few people in the world that I consider a, a, a human hero, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and then at the last minute he said I'm not going to come because I think I might attract too much attention, and so he didn't come. Oh, that's really wise. Yeah, it was it was profound. I don't think that that would have happened uh, because there were some credible people there. You know, Thomas Berry was there. His brother was there. Winona LaDuke was there. Yeah. Um, um, I, 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 Jerry Mander was there. The Great Lakes, I was thinking of Winona yeah. Ojibwe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She and, um, oh, um, the the leader at that time of the Fourth World Movement, um, oh, from England. Oh, gosh, I forget. Uh, great Shakespeare, he recited, recited Shakespeare to us. We had mm -hmm. times for cultural sharings and they were tremendous. They were all free form uh, and then music and recitation. And that was, that was incredible. It's so rich um, performances. Um, it, um, it was unbelievable, but, um, but uh, yeah. But, um, uh, so, and, and, and the Planet Drum folks came as a contingent mm -hmm. and had their own, had it more, pretty much their own cabin mm -hmm. where they, they, they did their thing in, the, in their cabin. So we had these camps and cabins and, and mm -hmm. loci of different kinds of activity, the Aboriginal camp, the this and that, it was all this stuff going on. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Uh, uh, but as far as the gender uh, or the um, gender equality was, was phenomenal, I've never seen anything like it. It was so clean with that, you know, um, and all the congresses were like that. I never, it was the most evolved gender of equality and resonance and fluidity that I've ever seen anywhere, ever, ever before. Um, and, th and that was conscious. There were things done to make that happen that were consensed upon by the group. As, as to our, our level of, um, of, of people of color, we, we, we did have some Native people there. For the most part, a lot of our, our bioregional congresses have been mostly white people. Mm -hmm. And um, we, that we tried really hard. We've had native people at a number of them. Um, and we've had caucuses of native people and, and uh, non-white people uh, before. We've, we've, we've had sessions where we were 
we're discussing the issues of race in all this, but we tried as hard as we could, but we, we, we lacked the resources to, to reach out into, and, and we also would, had lacked resources to educate people who didn't hear, didn't know about bioregionalism in order to search to the point where they would be interested in coming to our greeting with the connection but i you know, mean so it, this, yeah this is what i mean with like the 19 mid 1980s were a very different time it is quite a long time ago um and things have moved on and and now with with social media th those connections could be made made more easily yes but one thing that i i'm wondering because i'm sort of sitting with it very personally at the moment i've just recently been connect uh, contacted by a group here that is somewhat academically led um, out of some research center at the University of Saragossa, where it seems like there's a bioregional agenda starting here where people use the word bioregionalism, but what they're really connecting are five or six sociopolitical administrative districts in the northern part of Spain. Um, okay. We're talking about that entire very large area that sort of spans from the Atlantic coast, like the Gulf of Biscay, over through the Pyrenees to Catalonia, a uh, big chunk of north eastern Spain, so to speak. We've had um, Catalonian representation at the Congress several times. I just had to say that. Don't want ah, you to lose your, a, yeah. fellow, a wonderful fellow named Joes, Joes, Joseph Puig. Ah, anyway. Wonderful. Okay. Anyway, sorry, so, I, I couldn't but, help myself. But it, there is this there is this issue around bioregionalism. On the one hand, you can look at it as we've been talking as as a natural expression of the scale linking, health generating, abundance generating patterns that ecological systems need to have in in order to be healthy and dynamic and be able to evolve to be regenerative to like the yes. variability for Gaia or the, the 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 global system to continue its evolutionary and regenerative journey needs this way that humanity re needs to re-inhabit its bioregions like rematching human patterns to the bioregion but that's the the geophysiological the 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 planetary health argument for bioregional <laughs> Then, then you've also pointed out with these 29 pillars that, that we can't go into detail on all of them, but, but that sort of integrate all of human culture and affairs in an ecological way through education, through, through our transport systems, energy systems, housing systems, you name it, Everything. Into, into place. Yes. And yet there is this dimension which is sociopolitical also with all this, that this is the healthy scale at which you, you you can still find um, consent on how to live in place. You can build identity with region and through that build a shared we that is actually beyond just the human we that is 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 we as this place as expressions of place. But and this is what I'm trying to do, tie the bow of this long sentence. Um, there's also increasingly now a political movement that is a little bit about political separation, like the Catalan system mm. separating from Spain. And now these people are trying to mark out a larger region that is, is, is trying to create bioregional identity. <coughs> Similarly, Cascadia in, in yes. the, on, on the West Coast. Um, how do you see these movements and how can we keep them healthy cosmopolitan bioregionalism globally connected and collaborative as as a way of healing the relationship between people and planet and avoid that they become antagonistic to the current nation nation state patterns even if we agree like i i've i've said before that i find that, that nation states are definitely an anachronism for the 22nd century but probably <coughs> will take some time to to be like to, to like there, there are now so many historical and I identity ties also at the national level that what i want to avoid is that by regionalism becomes seen as a kind of separatist um subversive movement that 
threatens the nation state rather than yeah. a movement that heals yeah. the nation state's relationship to place yeah. and its capacity to be truly yeah. global. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 How, yeah, yeah, no, I, I can address that in two yeah. or three ways. Just uh, by, by, by um, narrative and, and um, analogy, uh, um, at, in the organizing of the first North American Bi-Regional Congress, I was also tracking the green political movement around the world. Mm -hmm. And, and seeing, seeing um, this is in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, and seeing that, 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 that we needed to get something going in the green political, green politics realm um, uh, in terms of the green politics expressed within the, within the, the, the boundaries of the nation state. And so in the invitation to the first North American Bioregional Congress, I sent out a communique to every, every nascent uh, green party or green political movement group that I could find, that I could identify. Um, and anyone who, and I could, who, who uh, was on the radar, my radar, that might be possibly interested to come to the first North American Bioregional Congress and actually begin the process of organizing the United States Green Party. And um, I felt because I felt that, that it was strategic necessity to try to put an ecocentric and bioregional spin on the evolution or the, the generation of a green political movement in the United States, as opposed to letting it drift down anthropocentric and what could I consider the useless kinds of uh, um, positioning of the left and right, which I find just utterly useless and, and counterproductive. And so we did in, in fact uh, have at NABC one, the, the first the, 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 a committee called the Green Movement Committee. And about uh, 10 or 15 people came and, and uh, out of that committee, we formed an organizing group and then from there we went on and, and had the first meeting of the United States Green Party. And my, and my um, intent um, was to, to try to frame green politics in the United States in an ecocentric, non-left, non-right, um, non-anything, non anthropocentric frame, context, uh, so that a truly different politics could emerge which, which, which was actually had a capacity for uh, mainstreaming and, and try to just, just a completely different formulation. So, uh, and, and there were people at, at the first Congress, NABC one, were really strongly opposed to ha having this happen within the Congress and really wanted me not to do it. And um, I'm not gonna say they were right or wrong, but, um, we did go ahead with it. And we didn't even try to bring our, our committee statement to consensus at the first Congress because we knew it wouldn't pass, but we, we presented our statement to the Congress. And that Green Movement Committee statement is the beginning of the North America, of the, of the uh, beginning of the United States Green Movement, Green Political Movement, Green Party. So it was an attempt to bring forth deep ecolog deeper ecological, uh, uh, ecocentric principles inject them into politics in the, and to address and deal with the electric, electoral system as a tr strategic m move, because you can't have bioregionalism coming into uh, uh, realization all at once. It's gonna take a long time. Yeah. Meanwhile, we have to deal with nation states. We have to deal with the geopolitical boundaries. We have to deal with electoral systems. And that's why I did this. Um, so you, and, you, you would see the, the long process of refitting human patterns of habitation back into this health generating, scale linking way that ecosystems and like place being fractal. Um, we, we inhabit place and through that heal the region and by healing the region actually heal the planet. But we, we do so in relationship to the local uniqueness of, of culture and place. Um, yes, and 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 sometimes we have to work with the existing structures, exactly, yeah. and not and and work we have to, and we we could theoretically work fruitfully with with the, within a nation state electoral system to bring about a transitional strategy toward something that is this the complete holism of the unitary reality that is that is by originalism, mm -hmm. but 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 we have to deal with these things. We can't ignore them entirely, 
and and so that was why I, I, I adopted this strategy. I, I mean, I still think that it's basically in order to, because there's also good friends like, like Helena Norberg Hodge would, every time I mention the word region and regionalism, um, she cringes because she she's so strongly favors the, the local. Um, but through my experience from anything in the eco-village movement, also looking at transition towns, when, when, you, when you take it to the scale of a few thousand people or even a few hundred people of a local community, you, you just simply do not have the economies of scale that you need to really provide for that, those people in a way that actually generates abundance in the place as well. Um, and it becomes kind of hide away from the world rather than taking responsibility for local, like a whole watershed and therefore also planetary responsibility. Yeah, yeah. And, and so for me, bioregionalism is, is somewhat also the missing link in making the high political um, ideal of subsidiarity possible. For a nation state to truly be able to serve local people in local communities, you need the bioregion, the local people to organize at the bioregional scale and meet their needs at the bio. Then you, you can devolve a lot of what is currently held at the nation state level into the bioregional level of decision making, enable the national level to be subsidiary to that, to support it, and but still also in a, almost like a sociocracy structure, have the different bioregions of a na national territory delegate up to represent at international processes, because this whole process is going to take a century of, of coming back into regions. So there, there's a lot of court, and we, we currently have a lot of animosities between these nation states for historical reasons. And, and yes. to, but, but I think, again, or even these animosities, if, if all nations started a pro process of re-regionalization, of re-inhabitation into ecosystems and, and healing their ecosystems, in the context of this planetary emergency of, of, of the current extinction and, and uh, like their current, current extinction rates, current ecosystems collapse and, and climate change, I, I feel like it could actually have a healing function, but it has the danger of becoming a political pinball in some sort of socio-political ideological game. Um, yeah. yeah. yeah um, by the way, um, if you talk to Helena, please say hello for me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I met her several, many years ago and uh, a couple of times and um, um, well, she's an astounding soul. So <laughs> and, I mean, she's she's done some beautiful oh my yeah amazing yeah, yeah. work in her life and still does like I don't know if you've seen that she's she's um started this world localization day last year um, I, I need to catch up on her work I, I've been I, I I go back to Ladakh uh -huh. and and not and, and I need to catch up because she's always doing something wonderful so <laughs> think, like last last year she organized the world localization day I think it was in early April or something. And it, it got a lot of like um, David Corton and a lot, mm -hmm. lot of really interesting people contributed. And I mean, I, it's, I'm completely aligned with the need for like mm -hmm. this. In order for bioregionalism to really work, you need subsidiarity, you need the political yes. reshuffling, yes. and you need economic re regionalization or localization. Yes. You, yes. You, you need to empower local communities and the regional economies to um, not be kind of walling themselves off from the world, but to actually support, you, you need to support your local farmers. People in the region oh, yeah. could, could, could eat local food. And there, there should be incentives in terms of provisioning even of companies and public offices and so on, that you, you buy local first. You don't yes, buy in China yes. just because yes, it's exactly. cheaper. And there shouldn't, yeah. and this is where Helena would agree, there shouldn't be all these yeah. strict rules, the trade rules, that incentivize or almost enforce these ridiculous trade yeah. parcels where, yeah. where Arkansas exports as much milk yes. than it imports. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, 
in my in my piece on bioregional economics, bioregionally uh, bioregionalism and economics, at the end there are fourteen points, mm -hmm. and they're very specifically addressed uh, in the context of the law of subsidiarity, mm -hmm. which is very elemental to my work. By mm -hmm. the way, it's a critical thing, but um, but that that um, how how actually that, that a, a kind of a little checklist of how to localize is is in that in those fourteen points, um, but um. But that, but but yes, um, there's a necessity of of scale, and starting locally, um, you go you go up the up the up the up the scale up the uh, size of the scale and the subsidies of larger and larger units of scale, and the bioregion I think has has the, the most in, the deepest integrity of all ways of configuring. What I call, you know, e eco-spatial reality, but um, but yes, that my, I have a little formula. I call it uh, A A M A S P, as much as possible. So you're always trying to do these things with some concentration, as much as possible, and always trying to increase. So the amount of local food, and then scaling up the amount of re regional connection for that that which you cannot source at the local level scaling up uh, and then you know it's like uh, ecosystem watershed bioregion um then uh, biogeographical province continent um there's this there's this this level of ecologically defined scales yeah. and um so and the scale is really important for maintaining the local the larger scale because because a lot of the resource agencies now uh, and the larger environmental groups, uh, ecological conservation groups like the Nature Conservancy, back in back in the 80s, they went to an eco-regional approach, mm -hmm. um, and I think they were informed by bioregionalism by in that, as well. Some of the national agencies in the in the EPA, et cetera, began to focus and make watershed maps. And agencies, resource agencies, fish and wildlife, et cetera, et cetera, began to realize that they could not protect any species that they were trying to keep from going extinct or becoming threatened unless they protected at least a watershed, if not larger. Mm -hmm. So you, so basically, point being, to your point, um, a healthy, thriving, local ecological economy, which is this again, this profound meta principle uh, which is so important and so limitlessly, limitlessly deep um, you without having that having a larger functioning um, watershed you can't you can't you can't keep the local economy healthy any more than you can a species in a locality without the, uh, some degree of health of the larger surrounding scale and and on outward mm -hmm. and Again, I've I've often said, in the in the um, the, the hollow fractal of, uh, of 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 ecological health, no human being eventually can be any more healthy than their 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 ecosystem, their watershed, their bioregion, and their planet. Yeah. And, which, is, and which is exactly it, resonant with what I wrote in my my PhD in two thousand and six on design for human and planetary health. Health is. In, in terms of complexity, it's an emergent property of this nested wholeness, and it emerges at the cellular level, the organ level, the individual level, the family level, the community level, the ecosystems level, and, and yes. the planetary level. Yes. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting to see that, that like, all these ways of defining boundaries have to be as much as possible. They have to be somewhat fuzzy. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, and, and 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 yeah, and and flexible. Yeah, I I have a little piece called "How to Organize a Bioregional Congress," mm -hmm. and it's it's and it just shows like how how you do this, and um, one of the things about it is that you you know you don't have to, in order to bring an ecological centrality into your into a, any given place, no matter how you define it, you can still do that. You don't have to use a bioregional term, or you can use it do it within a county or a state. These things are these things are imperfect, by of course. But if if that's your only choice, then it's the as much as possible and always increasing again. We can we can introduce this 
this, these modalities into these frameworks, which are not optimal, and still begin to move the whole, pro whole process forward. Um, sometimes the word bioregionalism being, if I'm pronouncing this right, a neologism, you know, a Greek and Greco Roman, uh, Greco Roman Italian word, you know, uh, um, is, is too uh, esoteric, uh, you know, for some, for it to explain. Well, if you can't, if it's not possible, it takes too many resources to explain the word, just go ahead and do the work, yeah. which is to bring an ecological platform ecological design platform underneath of everything regardless of how you configure it in time space and politics yeah. and in the process yeah the, the, the last <laughs> sentence of, you sounded like my ex-phd supervisor john <laughs> <laughs> okay But, and, and, have, you, have you seen have you seen this map before um i have it's a world watershed map Yeah, it's it's Robert Zooks. Uh, um, it's a, it's a from, it's, I'm glad you. Uh, it's a from, it's the most astounding thing. It's beautiful, isn't it? Like, isn't it? It's it's beyond descriptions how phenomenal it is. Because it, because this is the map of how the Earth really looks like. The also yeah. it, like you know that there's a major movement of of climate scientists saying that we we are running into a real conundrum if we frame climate change entirely through the carbon lens and that oh yeah the whole, oh yeah it, particularly in the context of ecosystem oh, yeah. restoration and, oh, and yeah. responding to planetary health and human health oh, we yeah. need to look at the water cycles at the scale of local watersheds when we when we do our healing work if we just look at part yeah. a million in the atmosphere it's not going to work yeah and and you know and actually also climate change It, as a as a as a, 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 a gigantic and, and horrendous problem mm -hmm. there's too much focus on it because it's only a symptom yeah. a gigantic symptom of something much much larger exactly. which is a whole gaia wide uh, dis disintegration of ecosystems under the pressure of of conventional economic systems etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. yeah, i mean I'm all in favor of people focusing or using climate change, but, 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 but beyond, it's so much larger than that. Exactly. So much more deeper, so much more mul multi uh, some multiplicity. There's, I've often thought there's nobody, no human being, no group of human beings, no scientific uh, coterie anywhere that has a handle on the totality of the, uh, the agencies that are, that are eroding the ecosystem, ecosystemic integrity of the planet. It's beyond anyone's ca capacity to comprehend, mm -hmm. and the only and it's important to look at it at a absolutely systemic level that transcends even the most in, enormous and overwhelming of meta symptoms, which is climate change. But then that, that, that's why that the interesting thing is like on the one hand, yes, um, absolutely in agreement, climate change is is only a symptom, um, and. At the same time, well, like we need to keep supporting the movement that is saying this is a critical issue. And For sure. And we need to keep the dialogue open that let's not make the mis mistake of treating symptoms because then other th symptoms will get us somewhere else should we find a technical <laughs> solution, which we won't. That's right. Um, yeah. I mean, my, my another mentor and, and now also a friend of mine, um, Fritjof Capra, Um, when I first read this sentence, which I think the first time I read it, but he actually wrote it in other books in a different way much earlier, was in 2002 when he wrote this book on, on sustainability. And he, he framed it something along the lines of um, the ecological crisis, the climate crisis, the social crisis, the quickening economic crisis cycles, Are really all manifestations of a much larger crisis that that is upstream from them, and he called it a, a crisis of perception or a crisis of consciousness. Um, it's it's a crisis of relationship of who are we, what are we, how do we relate, how are we obliged? Um, that the the Cartesian split between humanity and nature and and and, and all that. Um, but at the same time, even if we where to expand our 
attention from from climate change and ecosystems collapse and and ocean acidification and all these other problems and the planetary boundary transgressions um i i think one of the the powers of the re regenerative practice approach is this flip away from the focus on problems symptoms to fix to potential evolutionary potential in people and places to realign with this health generating process that that, that we've been talking about yeah 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 and, um, yeah. and uh, again i think that it is in this fractal fractal nature of place of uh, starting in your locality in your community in a bioregional context in that you you you, you can actually create pathways to manifesting potential together that that i think is the the work of our time yeah, yeah the, the uh, that word regeneration you know is so profound and mm -hmm. i like to couple it with resilience you know because it's also very profound particularly seen in a deep, you know deep ecological context and um one of the ways that i kind of kind of uh, meld these or fuse these things of re of deep resilience and deep and deep uh, regen and regeneration is in the idea of alliance with nature a conscious active working alliance with nature and um um and in in looking at at how nature can regenerate and how nature manifests its phenomenal capacity for resilience you know look at mount saint helen for instance virtually a moonscape after the eruption spirit lake was densely gone filled with 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 all kind of organic debris and ash it was a moonscape and then the scientists went in there and they began to to watch life come back mm -hmm. And, and began to flourish and they saw the minutiae of how it was done and how the species came from nowhere or somewhere. Uh, all this to say that the earth, earth nature is full of colossal capacities of resilience and regeneration. Yeah. And if the human beings, human beings are to really s gather to get together in their, in their, in their mind and think of this and act actively engage in a, this conscious active alliance with Gaia with these tremendous powers mm -hmm. therein lies the capacity for the possible continuance of our species mm -hmm. and the and I yeah, sorry and, and, and just one more thing I have to say this I would say 15 or 20 years ago looking at the when I was still writing this piece on the 28 um, elements of the total ecology or the elements of the of uh, the 28 elements of mo mo modalities eco eco design modalities i couldn't see how they could come to a degree of fruition that would make any difference at all to the the incredible negative momentum that the the uh, conventional human e economics has on the planet the destruction the wholesale destruction of it but in the last 10 years, I have seen things come to levels of sophistication and, and um, development and um, that they're a mind boggling. So many bodies of work, mm -hmm. uh, the permaculture, the work of Alan Savory, the work of uh, the, the, that uh, John Todd and the, and the new alchemy and, and ecological engineering and the ocean arcs, um, um, uh, you know, so people doing soil regeneration uh, 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 these things are incredible and in aggregate I do see mm -hmm. that they have now the power to reverse and um, uh, activate in, a, in conscious active deepest alliance with nature to, to turn this thing it's possible I see that it, it, it is possible or was possible no, I, no think, I, I don't. I don't think. I don't think it's. I really don't. I can't. My brain cannot see how this can possibly happen, given this juggernaut of of, of ecological entropy this, that the human beings are engaging in. Mm -hmm. However, I I have a very deep article of faith that it was possible that we got we got to the point where we could I could see it 
and it could have been done. That's still, important to me. I, I still think it can be done. And, and it, there's still like, the interesting bit is in the, even in the linguistic framing that like the, the one, one thing that um, people in the Regenesis group, Karis Hanford and, and, and then Regenesis group, Pamela Mang, Ben Haggard, um, Bill Reed and so on, they, they have certain frameworks that I find quite useful in describing how does regeneration differ from conventional sustainability practice. And one of the, the, the spectrum that they first came up with says that the minute you, you step from working restoratively, fixing things that we've done wrong, to working regeneratively, you really align, and it's very aligned with what you were just saying, you align in the word, words co-evolving mutuality. Nice, yeah. The, the system that brings you forth and con contains you. Yeah, so yeah. you. You actually um, mm -hmm. even go beyond this. With, with, like I love Janine Benius's work. I love John Todd's work. Mm -hmm. But there's the, the language of learning from nature in the, in the word from mm -hmm. in others' nature. It puts nature out there mm -hmm. and where human <laughs> beings are separate and we need. And, and the, the big magic of co-evolving mutuality and working regeneratively as aligned to the evolutionary impulse um, you is is that you actually work as nature, which is this very no yeah. notion of it being an expression of the bioregion. Um, that that on the one hand, on, on the other hand, because you said regeneration and resilience, and I agree with you, and also the word health, but those the people I just mentioned, they to my mind have an, a jump to make in understanding that both the word resilience and the word health can be understood in a pathogenic way in a kind of there's a fixed state of a of a, of a healthy resilient system or there's a healthy system that and you, you have a sort of as if health was or resilience was a fixed state that you fall out of and you show symptoms of ill health or non-resilience, and then you have to come back to it. But but you can also see both of these terms as evolutionary capacities. Um, when you when you take a salutogenic approach to health, then health is this ongoing journey of learning, of evolving, of recontextualizing, of redefining relationships between self and world in this tension, this polarity that we all have of being both part of like being being for oneself and being as part of a larger whole. And in, in that dynamic, you, you then can see that health is an evolutionary concept and resilience is an evolutionary concept. And what, what, what I love particularly there is that if you look into the deep science of resilience, Buzz Holling and, and, and Gunderson and all, all these ecosystems, um, ecologists that have been studying resilience for, for decades, when they made the jump from studying just ecological systems to studying what they called socio-ecological systems, putting humanity back in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they said, okay, now that we're talking more appropriately, not of ecological systems out there, but of yeah. us always being a factor in them, we, we can't but, yes. we're in the Anthropocene, we're affecting everything. Yes. Um, then they are said, the minute we're part of the system, the human capacity for foresight and anticipation, for seeing patterns and knowing that we can respond to them and that we can create a system that, that will weather storms that we see coming better because we've prepared. In that moment, you, you have a dynamic transformability element of resilience that isn't the bounce back to the original status quo mm -hmm. but can actually be a bounce forward of yeah. saying let's apply these 28 or 29 pillars of um, an ecological civilization let's work on all of them in an integrated way and create bioregionally locally and globally nested health in the system to to be able to over the next th three four five decades heal the the planetary crisis we, we we can reverse climate change 
if we put our minds to it. Yeah, I, I love what you're saying. I completely agree with you. Um, and the idea of, of, of going forth in an evolving, uh, a, a co-evolving um, realization, understanding of resilience and regeneration as nature, that's, that's, that's really, that's, that is, that is, that's profound. That's, 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 that's better. <laughs> I mean, I think Thomas Berry, that, that's what, what Thomas Berry, because we started with Thomas Berry, um, that's what he was on about to my mind. When, when the universe story is like, just recently I was on a, on a beautiful um, new program, which was called um, Tools for the Regenerative Renaissance. Uh -huh. And, and this, this young woman called Phoebe Tickell um, kicked us off on a session on regenerative agriculture. And she, she chose really beautifully how, how she framed it all. And she, she brought in this, this poem, very powerful um, African-American poet. Um, and in the, po the, the poetry says these lines, one of them is, is kind of Thomas Berry, um, you're made from stardust. But she, she added the word, you're made from soil and stardust. And and I it's it's when we re enchant our relationship to Gaian cycles. That's when we I mean we we found find our peace in this larger process and we can let go of whether it's ultimately important for humanity to live another ten million years or just another Ten generations, um, and we can still feel part of the ongoing journey of life. Like I, I remember Joanna Macy saying the, uh, this to me once in a, in a way that it just really landed in my physical body. That the sting of life, this uh, that the sting of death disappears when you when you see that death is actually the way that life creates conditions conducive to life. And that, that it's almost like we need to die in, in order to live forever. And yeah, beautiful. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, yeah. I um, it's kind of a side note, but I I, I worked with Thomas, um, and I but in 1984, the same year that we had the first by original Continental Congress. In the, in the year that we started the green U.S. Green Party, after the first NABC, I also got an idea from somewhere to start the, uh, something I called the North American Conference on Christianity, Christianity and Ecology, oh, okay. and NACCE, mm -hmm. putting it in a continental context. And I worked with Thomas on that, and he gave the first donation towards a little fund to get that going. Um, mm -hmm. And I worked, and that was an incredible experience over. Um, Mary Evelyn Tucker? Did, yes. Yeah. She was, uh, yes. She was involved, yes. Um, because she, but, wrote, uh, she wrote this series of books that I thought were absolutely beautiful, where she, ecology and Buddhism, ecology and Islam, ecology and Christianity, and she sort of identifies the. the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we, uh, we consciously were kind of working that. Uh, Vein and I, we were working coterminously with a group called Shomre Adama, which was a Judaism and ecology group mm -hmm. at that time in the 80s. And there was also a woman named Nancy Nash, who was a Christian, who was uh, had a Buddhism and ecology group, uh, international effort going at that time. And uh, but um, I worked in the in the NACCE up until the early 90s. But it was an astounding experience um, in, in which a North American Conference on Christianity and Ecology. I believe Mary Evelyn Tucker was is a, she was a, a, a student of uh, of Thomas, I believe, in the and maybe involved in creation spirituality, along with Matthew Fox, possibly. I, she, I don't think she attended any of the NACCE gatherings, but we had one major North American gathering in 1987 in North Indiana. And it was an amazing thing. It was uh, different uh, Christian groups from all over the United States and different parts of the world came together. We even tried to make a consensus statement and then with, with Carolyn Estes facilitating, but it, we couldn't quite get there. But, uh, but uh, yeah, it was, it was uh, uh, Herman, Herman Daly was um, 
um, you know, was a part of the Christian ecology movement, uh, as well as, as father, one of the fathers of ecological economics. Um, but there were, it was, it was a, that was an amazing several years, these different de denominations. And, um, but I, it's kind of a side note, but I just, you know, I just, uh, just wanted to bring up, I guess, just how, how, how important, uh, working with Thomas was and, and, um, he 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 formulated the idea of the Ecozoic Age, which I um, love much more than yeah. Anthropocene. I, yeah, it, yeah, it, another and, uh, anthropocentrism. The <laughs> last time I got, last time I talked to Thomas was at the funeral of his brother Jim, who I worked with very closely in the Christian ecology movement. Um, but um, I, um, I I had a chance to to talk with Thomas about the Ecozoic Age in our last conversation on Earth, and uh, I told him about my concept of of uh, of my my iteration of his statement about the reinvention of the human, and uh, his kind of central statement, and, it, and an idea that came to me, I called eco sapien, mm -hmm. and uh, I mentioned this in an email, mm -hmm. but um, but uh, I, I got a chance to talk to him about eco sapiens, and uh, how I thought that um, that in the Ecozoic age it was a time for the human species to consciously mutate uh, into uh, a being that was uh, different from what I call Homo techno industrialis, mm -hmm. which is an, which I call it is a non non viable mutation of the human species that we're currently in. But um, anyway, um, thanks for letting me throw in some things that are important to me, uh, yeah. somewhat out of context. So I'm 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 done with my side side notes. <laughs> no, but this is it's beautiful, right? Because I I I find this whole. I mean, Thomas really hit a couple of key notes, like the the reenchantment of the universe, the bridging of the scientific story of how amazing this ever evolving totality that we're we're coming forth out of really is. Um, that's still ongoing like I, d I don't know to, to what extent you're familiar with brian swim's work one of his his students yeah. and he brian, came to our he came to our third continental congress and uh squamish right. just briefly made an appearance and it was i was like i was astounded like yeah <laughs> I, I i once I, I, because you mentioned shakespeare earlier <laughs> somebody citing shakespeare i once had the the pleasure of taking um brian swim and his wife for lunch at Cordor Castle in Morayshire, and and um, Macbeth was the thane of Cordor, like the true historic, historically correct Macbeth that existed, mm. lived in that castle, and so <laughs> so, so I, I yeah yeah I, I managed to create, provenance <laughs> I, I managed to create an unforgettable um, experience for for Brian, so we're, we're always nice. in, in good contact. Nice, but, but the other bit that that. Um, Thomas Berry also started as an impulse that has since evolved in, and, and found many other voices to, to speak to it, is the whole notion of earth jurisprudence and the giving nature rights um, or creating rights of nature treaties. Um, yeah. and, and that has evolved like the work of, of Polly Higgins with, with the kind of making ecocide a... Um, mm law against uh, like a crime against humanity yes. and and the, the um alliance for the rights of nature and earth law and all that and another really crucial impulse in in healing our relationship yeah. with the, the planet yes that's something i've followed a great deal mm -hmm. going back into uh, that book a book called do trees have standing mm -hmm. uh, which was the first book i know that actually brought a court case um uh it was that the, I forget the author, but um, it was a something a, a lawsuit, I think, against uh, Disney. Of, of uh, anyway, uh, but yeah, I have I have a a good friend who who's, who's worked for years on uh, going back into the Magna Carta mm -hmm. to develop uh, and basically turn inside out the the, the idea of um, of um, oh. Gosh, of, of, of um, burden of proof, mm -hmm. burden of proof, 
presently burden of proof stands with again in a court case burden of proof stands with 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 those with the uh, the people who are the plaintiffs uh, the damage having been done mm -hmm. and he was he was he was working really hard as a really highly accomplished lawyer also as a member of our christian ecology group to change that create a body of, of theoretical work to change the burden of proof uh, saying that the Magna Carta supports that to say that the burden of proof is on the polluter. Mm -hmm. It's very fundamental, but this is just an example of, yeah, of some of the work of, of, of uh, ecological yeah. jurisprudence. It, it, it's, it's the precautionary principle applied to um, environmental crime. Quite so, um, quite so. Yeah. Wow, this has been yet another wonderful <laughs> conversation. I'm just beginning to realize that it is um, all <laughs> half past. Uh, it's half, yes. half past ten here, um, so <laughs> I should probably wrap it up. But okay, one one thing that I would really love to do is is to we'll, we'll look look at, at it via email. I'd love to host those writings that you shared with me on the medium blocks, and then I can send you the link so you can share it with. Okay. With people as well more easily rather than having to sell that send them the document oh that's that's yeah. wonderful that's because wonderful. We, we've both in this recording and in the previous one that that kind of breaks off because of the snow piling up on you yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we, we've referred to these documents and we've referred a number of times to the the 28 pillars and and some people will have the, the minds to say i want to look at that so so i want to be able to link them to the recording um, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I I I don't know how many. I have three or four basic seminal pieces, some of which I sent to you. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you want any more. You know, if you want me to go m more into let, the let's start list. With those three that I have for okay, for, and then they, there's but there might be something that could be really interesting. I've been contacted with a with by a. Um, by somebody doing a PhD on bioregionalism in California. Mm. Mm -hmm. and if you don't mind, I would love to put her in touch with you because yes. think, as part of her research, she's she's currently interning at the Planet Drum Foundation and how ah, then oh, great. archives because I think they moved the archives to Stanford University now. Oh well, I you know I wasn't aware that they'd found a home. They were trying to find a home for Peter Berg's archives. Right. And the last I know that Judy could hadn't been able to find find one. So well, if, if she has. Well, She's working on that. So I'll put you in touch, touch with her. Okay, and, please do. Because I think that it'd be really, also I'll, I'll send you a link of a wonderful conversation I had with Isabel Carlyle, who set up the UK Bioregional Learning Center. Oh, nice. And, and you, you'll really enjoy that conversation too. So, like, this is not the last conversation. <laughs> but, okay, I hope so. Is on the rise and I would, I would love to, to make people I, what I want to invite people to is not to make the mistake of not reading the history on this because there is so much deep, as you said, it's not just your thinking and knowledge. It's the collective that, that did this beautiful work over these Congresses and has come up with some consensus based deep outputs yeah. that, yeah, that we aren't would. some ego trip of one individual <laughs> or, or visions of an, but, but, but I, a consensus reality. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Let's, let's get it out to the people. <laughs> we, tr we tried to create a constitution for the North American continent, for Turtle Island, and for the Ozarks and the other, the other budding ecological nations, you know? So that was what we were kind of about, you know? And, uh, and but uh, I'll send you some things. And if I yeah. send too many, just, just tell me to stop. Yeah. But I, there are, I would like to have, I, I'm so grateful to have some a venue for to put this on the web because I just never thought about it or never pursued it. So Let's thank see. you, thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for taking time to to go oh. visit your daughter so we can speak with a with a better connection. It's 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 much. Easier. Oh well, it, it, it was an absolute pleasure and an honor, and I'm um, deeply deeply grateful. <laughs> Likewise, give you a big hug and yeah, a big hug. The rest of the day, and I'll I'll be in touch soon. Bye -bye. Great, great, Daniel. Bye-bye.